I know as we uh, kick off today's message, the burning question in everybody's mind was whether the mustache would make a reappearance <laughs> or not. And uh, either sadly or gladly, no, it is gone. And uh, it, it went away just about as fast as it came. And uh, you don't have to clap for that. Come on. You don't have, I mean, there's no point in all that. Um, no, I understand. But what was funny is uh, obviously the response to that. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then I must ask you a question. See what I did there? All right. Last week in, in, in our messages, I came out wearing a mustache talking about how all of us can't treat truth subjectively like it is objective. There is right. There is wrong. And we need people to help us to see that because we can't see ourselves correctly. But the funny thing was, like I said, I got such a visceral response from people regarding the stash. Um, and overwhelmingly, the majority was like, no, take it away. It looks ridiculous. And, uh, you, know, you know, you look creepy. But there was one demographic of people that were like, yes, keep it. It's awesome. It's so you. One of my really good friends here said, it's so Texas. Because if you don't know, I'm from Texas originally. And, and that demographic of people were males in between the ages of about 14-ish to late 30s, right? You know, bumping up to that age range. Overwhelmingly, we're like, keep it. Yes, it's awesome. We love it. And I said, well, I'm not married to any of y'all. And so, um, and my, my standard response was, maybe one day when my face is not, you know, round like a bowling ball, then I'll try it again. Um, so maybe, you know, who knows? Who knows? It's all... But you can go back and watch that message, and you go to our website, the mustache will just jump out at you, all right? But if you got a Bible today, what we're going to talk about is in Luke chapter 2, all right? Luke chapter 2. And as always, if you don't have a Bible, we have it here on the screen. And what I want to talk about today is we're coming to the end of this season of what we call Abide, 21 days of prayer, fasting, and worship. Uh, we are now seven days left, seven days Remaining, And again, if you're new and you haven't been a part of this at all, uh, it's totally fine. We've been praying and fasting and doing, you know, kind of fasting is taking things out. And two primarily things we've said, some type of food component, either fasting from all solid foods or a meal a day or sugar or something. And I've heard all kinds of things that people are fasting from. Anything from all food to sweet tea, right? I mean, just kind of coffee, all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's been great. And then the other thing we've asked people to fast from is social media, all social media, like literally take all your apps off the phone and all that kind of stuff because we want to take this time and really dedicate it to God, really say, God, we're, we're trying to block out all distractions. We want to abide in you. As we said, um, as we kick this series off, our one aim is to abide. Our one aim is to abide. And then we have to create grooves that help us to do that. And those grooves are like what we call spiritual disciplines, prayer, fasting, worship, giving, serving, all kinds of things, gathering. And so those grooves are what keep us focused. They what rifle us in on this one aim to abide. So we want to hit the bullseye. And so again, if you're new to that, you can jump in. It doesn't have to be 21 days. Uh, it can just be seven days. You don't have to you know, wait till next year and maybe God will speak to you today and say, you know, for the next seven days, you're gonna jump in to this with us. And, and those of us who have been in now for two weeks, we are excited because we can see the end zone, right? Like we can see the finish line, the light at the end of the tunnel. This is right when you're like, well, this is not so bad. I'm still not so sure about it. Or if I even like you as a pastor, but this has been good. And, and the point, again, is not just to have a religious experience, but the point is we, we take all these things out so that we can feast on the word of God, which is why we put together this abide God. And again, that's on our website or on our app. And, and we want you to dig into the word. We want you to reap the word. We want you to feast on that. And so what we're going to talk about in Luke chapter two is a, a similar practice that the Jewish people had. And in this story, and you may have heard this story before, it is one that, you know, if you've been around church, you're probably familiar with, but I want to approach this story in a little bit different. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, physically exactly what happened, but kind of use it also symbolically to pull out some principles for us to see how Jesus acted and lived in this story, because here's my hope for us. My hope is that we, didn't, we don't do these 21 days and then we leave the same as we did coming into it. I want us to re-enter well. 
I want us to re-enter into our old life well or re-entering things back into our life that we took out like food, like coffee, like social media. As we uh, face this you know, last turn, if you will, this last week, we need to think about, okay, how do I come out of this in a way where I don't just go back to my old grooves, where I don't just go back to my old habits, where I don't just go back to my old ways. I want to come out of this different. And we're going to look at this story in Luke chapter 2, again, to see how Jesus acted during a similar time and after he came out of a season of fasting and this festival that they celebrated. So Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52, it is this, and I'll read part of it and then I'll stop and we'll chat, all right? Verse 41, it says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So... I'll talk about feasts, but I thought it was appropriate since we're talking about fasting. Let's talk about feasting. Really great timing, right? And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. That's huge. They had a practice. They had a groove. They had a habit. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Continuing on, his parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. And and then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. So let's stop and chat for a minute. So again, this festival happened every year. And it was a seven-day festival. The Jewish people had many festivals that they would celebrate and uh, commemorate every year where they would travel back to Jerusalem and remember certain things or celebrate certain things. And this one was the big one. This is one that's called the Feast of Passover or the Festival of Passover. And And the point was not so much when it comes to feasting, like they were just gorging on all food, because it had a, 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 a histor- historical connection that, that was to mean something to them now. And, and the primary connection was when they left Egypt, when God freed them from slavery in Egypt, he passed over their sins because they took the blood of a lamb, put it on their doorpost. And when God judged sin, he judged the blood of the lamb in their place. And as long as that was on the doorframe of their house, the, 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 the judgment passed over them and they didn't receive the judgment. They received mercy. And then that night, they would head out of Egypt. Again, a, a rather famous story, very integral to the entire storyline of the Bible on the Exodus, there's an entire book about it, when they leave Egypt. But there was one particular thing that also happened during that time, because they were in such a hurry, they didn't have time to let the bread rise. And so they left, and now, in this seven-day festival, they would kick it off with the meal. It's called the Passover Supper or the Passover Seder, and they would have a meal, they would eat fish and other things, But one thing they would not eat is bread with leaven in it. They would not eat, you know, what we would think like a loaf of bread. It was more like a cracker, pretty flat, you know, um, I mean, just, you know, not this idea of bread that we think of. And the reason being is because it reminded them that they were in a hurry to get out of Egypt. And this is what I want us to see about why God had them celebrate this every year. One of the things is not only reminding them of their salvation, that God you know, had passed over their sins, but what was stark to me in this idea of eating unleavened bread is every year they would come together for seven days and slow down and remind themselves that they're no longer in a hurry remind themselves that they can have peace now. They have shalom. They can rest in who God is because God had saved them. God had forgiven them. He had passed over. And so it was a time where they would slow down. They would come together. They would celebrate the goodness of God, the salvation that God had given them. And then it would be a reminder, we're not in a hurry anymore. We don't have, we're not running anymore. We are resting 
now. And so that's the festival. But something happened after the end of this one, which you've already seen. At the end of the festival, Jesus decides to stay in Jerusalem in the temple, and his parents and family all decide to leave. Think of Home Alone. That's what happens. Never knew that Home Alone had a spiritual connotation to it. So they all leave. They're gone. Now, again, to Mary and Joseph's defense, I'll talk about them more in just a minute, their whole family would travel together, almost like in a caravan of people. And Nazareth was north of Jerusalem, but it was down the hill. And so they just whole caravan starts off down the hill and they're like, okay, everybody's here. Okay, we got the clan, we got the, cl the crew. And they go an entire day, an entire day and don't even know that Jesus is with them but, or not, a day. Now, those of us who are parents or those of us maybe who are not, but you've been responsible for people before, can you imagine going a day and missing somebody? A day. And not only were they missing their kid, they were missing the kid. <laughs> not the karate kid, the kingdom kid, the king kid. The kid who was a king, they are missing the kid of all creation. Think that's gonna create some panic in them? I mean, imagine standing before God on that one. Lord, I don't, I don't know. See, I mean, what happened was, you know, uh, my bad, you know. And obviously they're stressed and they're distressed. And in fact, look at the next few verses. They say it. It says, and his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Again, it is very stressful to lose your own child. I don't know if you've had that experience before. I've had those moments of, you know, minutes that felt like a day. We're like, where is my kid? But look at Jesus' response, verse 49. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Now imagine that. Imagine your kid saying that to you. You're like, boy, what? But this is Jesus. Now Jesus isn't being snarky. Jesus isn't being sinful here because we know that he was without sin. He is being serious though. Because look at his next statement. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Didn't you know? And here's where I want to kind of zero in on something. They had just been at a festival for seven days about slowing down, recentering their life on God. And one day after, they've already walked on from him. One day after the festival, they already left Jesus. Physically, yes, but also symbolically. To bring last week's message into this, they've already walked on from the truth. They already progressed. They already went too far. And Jesus is bringing back to the fact of, yes, the problem is not just that you left me, and that's dysfunctional parenting. There's something you didn't know. See, John, we'll get back into the gospel of John after this season. We're gonna jump back into John 9, but in John 8, Jesus said a rather famous phrase. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And then he talks about abiding in the truth, which is what we were talking about last week. And so what I wanna connect here for you is it had only been one day and they'd walked on from truth. And there was something they didn't know. And Jesus is reminding them they need to know. And it has to do with remaining in the presence of the Father. Abiding in. See, it says Jesus was in the temple. 
And yes, the temple was, a, the temple was a physical place. The foundation of it still exists in Jerusalem today. But we know from an Old Testament, New Testament perspective that the temple was never about a place. It was always about a person. That's where you went to meet with God. But when Jesus came, he reorients that. Now it's not about a place, but it is always about connecting with the person. And Paul actually even says, we are the temple now. We are the ones who houses the presence of God, which was always the point. So we're not trying to get back to something the way it used to be. And this is a big lesson for us, not only as we think about re-entering after these 21 days, but think about another you know, delineation of time between you know, Old Testament, New Testament. I've joked about this before Christ, also before COVID, a different BC. And there's a lot of people that are trying to go back. I just wanted to get back to normal. Yeah, because things were so awesome before COVID. It's not about getting back to normal, but it is about incorporating what has happened into our new normal. It's about coming out of it different. It's about knowing something that we didn't know before. It's about abiding in something that maybe we weren't abiding in before. It's about remaining in something that we were missing before. And now that we've had this experience, we don't want to re-enter unchange and then go one day and all the anxieties back and go one day and all the distress is back which again the moment watch me when you walk away from truth that's what happens when we walk away from truth it creates distress it creates anxiety it creates an unsettledness and Jesus is saying to his parents, again, not being snarky, but what he's saying is, I just wasn't ready to re-enter yet. And Jesus was hanging out in the temple, but again, it's not about the temple because the temple signified the teaching. And there's so many of us who have supposed that Jesus was with us, but, but we left him and we didn't even notice. Why? Because Jesus is hanging back in the teaching. Jesus is hanging back in the truth. Where is Jesus sitting? He's sitting in the truth because he is the word, right? That's what John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, Greek logos, the, the thing behind all the things. Why do you think the Bible uses that word to describe Jesus as word? Because teaching is made up of what? Words. And here's my fear for a lot of us. We'll come out of this season and we'll re-enter and we'll walk on and we will suppose that Jesus is with us. We'll suppose that he's with us. We'll lie to ourselves that he's with us. And he's back at the word. He's back at the place with his father. What if after the 21 days, God comes to you and he says, you know what? I need you to give me one more day. I need one more day. Not 21, 22. This is right when you're like, pastor, don't even put that thought in my head. This one. Already got plans for Golden Corral next Sunday. I got plans for an all-you-can-eat buffet. Jimmy's going to be there. I got plans, Pat. Don't you do that. I'm going back. But what if God says, no, I need you to hang with me one more day. Why? Because you're not ready to go back. You're still too anxious. You're still too divided. You haven't single-fied your life enough yet. You haven't rifled in. You haven't hit the aim you aren't unhurried enough yet. You're still too hurried. You're still too much like you were. Now, again, I'm not trying to insinuate that Jesus needed to stay for an extra day because he was somehow lacking. But what I'm saying is he wanted to. And he's our example, not only our savior. And his parents were freaking out because they supposed that he was with them. And now they're in great distress because they weren't ready to re-enter. 
How would it have been different if they would have noticed Jesus was hanging back with the teachers? And they said, son, you know, what are you doing? I'd like to hang one more day. Hey, guys, we're going to hang one more day. We're not trying to beat the traffic and get out of town. You know, it's congested on I-75 coming down Jerusalem. We want to hang here another day. Because we're not ready to re-enter. See, you know you're ready to re-enter when you're ready to react different to the world that you just came from. That's when you're ready to re-enter. See, look at what happens. Verse 15 says, and they did not understand that Jesus, the saying that Jesus had spoke to them. No doubt. And he went, he, Jesus, now listen to this, went down with them and came to Nazareth, down the mountain, north to Nazareth, and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. The only reason we know that is because apparently she's the one who's telling Luke this story. Verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Don't miss this. They increased in distress. He increased in wisdom. They increased in anxiety. He increased in favor. Because this was a decisive moment. See, at the age of 12, you are considered an adult in Jewish society. And we don't get much beyond Jesus's childhood, but this is a specific moment. And I think, again, in my opinion, it's Mary saying this because that was the moment things changed. That was the moment I would imagine she started to understand, oh, he ain't just my kid. He lives differently. Let me make this point to you and then I'll tease it out. Jesus was not controlled by them but he remained connected to them. Jesus was not controlled by them, but he remained connected to them. The most amazing thing about this story is the dichotomy. Jesus is abiding in the teaching. Jesus is hanging because he is the word. He's with his father. He's asking questions. He's teaching. He's learning. He's growing. He's teaching. I mean, I mean you just see this as a 12-year-old. This is crazy. And they go on supposing that Jesus is with them. They come back all anxious and Jesus is all peaceful. He's like, what y'all worried about? Why are you looking for me? He wasn't controlled by their chaos. He wasn't, watch this, he wasn't defined by their dysfunction. And I would just like to submit to you, if you lose your child for a day, you're dysfunctional. This is why, and I'm not being mean, but this is why we don't pray to Mary. Mary ain't God. Now, Mary was chosen and blessed. Yes, highly favored. Yes, but Mary herself would be like, don't pray to me, which I just think it's kind of funny. And again, probably she told this, but I would also think in her flesh, she would be like, 33 years, I nailed this. 33 years we went up and I didn't lose him. And you write about the one time I did? Right? The one time. The one time I lost him. Yeah, but it wasn't about the quantity. It was about who you lost. You lost Jesus. But again, on the flip side, I think the reason why she included it is because she wanted us to know how severe it is to lose Jesus. Jesus wasn't defined by that dysfunction in his family. Jesus wasn't controlled by their chaos that they created. But he remained connected to them. The text says he was submissive to them. Other translations say he was obedient to them. So he was obedient to the father first. 
That's where his peace, that's where his presence, that's where his calmness, that's where his definition of who he was came from. He wasn't defined by his feelings. He was defined by his father. But he didn't disconnect from his family. I've said this before, but my major in college and undergrad was communications. My minor was psychology. And psychology is a study of the mind, and you understand communication. And I thought, this is great for ministry because I'm going to be communicating to people with messed up minds, which is you. And so <laughs> psychology is great um, because psychology you know, helps us understand things about human behavior and why we do the things that we do. And I'm not saying I'm down with all psychology. Some of it's whack and crazy. But what was interesting to me, fascinating to me, is as I studied it, it gave such insight. And I love sociology, study of groups, and anthropology, study of cultures and people groups. And so I, I just kind of wig out on that stuff because it helps me understand humans and why we do what it is that we do. And one of the systems of thought that I became very interested in over the last few years is one that's called family systems theory. And again, I'm not trying to baptize everything about it, but there's something about it that was very intriguing to me that I'm trying to point out here. And, and there's a term in that that's called a self-differentiated person. And a self-differentiated person is this. There's two aspects to it. One, a self-differentiated person is not defined by their own feelings. They're not defined by them. They're not controlled by them. But they're also not disconnected from them. And think about this. I say this often on either side of the road is a what? A ditch. And so there's multiple ways to be wrong. And so a self-differentiated person is one who doesn't live in either ditch. They're not over functioning in their feelings where their feelings are calling all the shots, where their feelings are directing their behaviors. And this is one of the problems in our society today because we ask people what they think and they can't help but use words like, well, I feel. They can't connect truth from feelings. Feelings define truth instead of the other way around. And so we have an entire generation of people that are learning to be defined by feelings, and that person is not self-differentiated. But on the other end of the spectrum is someone who is so disconnected from their feelings. The kind of classic example is, you know, the masculinity that says, well, real men don't cry. Which are crying, boy. Which that is equally wicked and wrong. Where you're so disconnected from them all you ever say is, I think, never I feel. Which is one of the signs that you know that God is moving and working in a man's life again is he begins to cry again. Because we cry as boys, but we're told not to as men, which is insane. The shortest verse in the Bible, you know it. Jesus wept. He was a man. He had feelings. Oh, oh. Feelings. But watch this. He wasn't controlled by them. But he wasn't disconnected from them. There's a second part, the family systems theory of self-differentiation. It's not your feelings, but it's the feelings of your family or the predominant social group you're around, which can include friends, but obviously for all of us, it starts in families. And the same thing happens. We over-identify with our family's feelings of us, which this is when we get into people-pleasing. If they're not happy with us, we're not happy. If they're not proud of us, we are ruined. Or we disconnect from our family's feelings to the point where it also becomes unhealthy, and we have the mentality of, I'm shaking the dust off my, this town. Get me out of this place and these people. We say things like, I will never turn out like my father. And then you do. Because as Pete Cazero says, Jesus may be in your heart, but your grandfather or your father is in your bones. Even if you didn't know the man. 
So you can overfunction in your feelings or other people's feelings, or you can underfunction in your feelings or in others' feelings. And what I'm trying to point out to you is this. We're only ready to re-enter when we don't do either of those. See, Jesus was ready to re-enter life because he was defined by his father, but he didn't disconnect from his family. He was defined by his father. He wasn't defined by his family or his mother's or father's feelings about him. They are freaking out. And he was like, why are you looking for me? Cool as a cucumber, right? But he wasn't rude to them. He didn't snap at them. He submitted to them. You see what I'm saying? Jesus was healthy, and that's our goal. And so what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about re-entering the world, what I'm saying is the reason of this 21 days of prayer and fasting is it helps us reorient our appetites. It helps us reorient our relationships with things and with others. You know, we take food out for these 21 days. And I'll just be real straight with you. Some of y'all didn't take out enough because you were over-functioning in food. You're like, I can't give that up. Ding, 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 ding. Unhealthy. Let me give you a quote. I read this in our Thursday night gathering, but not in our Sunday gatherings. But I wanted to because it's so good. I read it last week, but I brought it back into this week by a guy named Jim Wilder. Listen to this. He's talking about food. He says, many of us have a habit of bonding with the food itself instead of the one who provided the food or the person who prepared it. Bonding with food, listen to this, leads to food addictions and unhealthy eating habits. When we bond with the food, we do not build our attachment, now listen to this, with others at the table and God who provided the meal. For food to act as a bonding agent, listen to this, we need good teaching. You need good teaching and training in the community. Learning how to use food and drink to build our love for each other should be a part of every church's discipleship program. Yes and amen. Yes. Which is why we have small groups community groups, where it's communities of people meeting together, building community, and living in the community. And our mission of our community groups is very simple. It comes just out of the mission of our church. You know, our mission is to grow people, gospel relationships, obedience, work. So what happens in a group is through relationships, we want to encourage obedience to the word, there's the O, and good works, there's the W, in the world. Very simple. But obedience to the word and good works in the world doesn't happen outside of relationship. So this is why sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do as a group is have a meal together. The most spiritual thing we can do is fellowship with each other. Because what it does is it shows us that food is not the point. The attachment to the people and to God behind it is the point. And the reason why we take 21 days to pray and fast because it's supposed to reset our relationship with food. Because a lot of us, myself included, prior to this, we live to eat instead of eating to live. And so eating becomes a form of idolatry. And again, we even call it comfort food. When I'm in my feelings, I need some comfort food. I've told you this, it's me, it's Rocky Road, baby. All kinds of good meat and food and mm, yes, amen. But this season is intended to reorient my appetite, which is funny because I've been joking about this You know, I'm not eating food. I'm drinking mostly protein shakes, mostly liquid, but occasionally I have some fruits and vegetables, eat some carrots with some hummus. And I was telling Lindsay, my wife, the other day, I'm like, I have never looked forward to carrots and hummus more in my life. 
Because growing up in Texas, we didn't have hummus. What the heck is hummus? We had hummers, <laughs> hummus, chickpeas. What is that? Some other kind of yard bird? What is that? It wasn't until I got older and eating more Mediterranean style stuff, and I like it, but I mean, I'll open up my fridge, and when I'm normally just eating, I'm looking for anything but carrots and hummus. Bell peppers, a bell pepper has never looked so great in my life. And I don't even like them. I mean, during regular seasons of, of feasting and eating, you know, there's normally like turkey lunch meat or ham lunch meat in our fridge, and I won't ever really eat it. But you go 14 days without it, and you look at that, and you're like, I will stomp a mud hole in that stuff right now. And if you don't know how to stomp a mud hole in some mask of redneck, they'll tell you, all right. <laughs> Why? Because my relationship with it is changing. I'm learning how to not be controlled by it. And see, here's the problem with a lot of us. A lot of us have not learned how to not let our appetites control us. And it's not just food. It can be our sexuality or sexual behavior, and I understand this might be a weird conversation for kids, but it was created by God. Nothing wrong with it. It's beautiful if you do it God's way. But if I'm controlled by my feelings, I'm controlled by what I feel I'm attracted to, and then when that feeling starts contradicting the word, and I start walking on, well, I left Jesus and didn't even realize it which is crazy to me, and I'm not trying to minimize the struggle. Don't hear that. What I'm trying to say, though, is Jesus made it incredibly clear. In heaven, there will be no sex or sexuality. The primary purpose is procreation, not pleasure. Read it. He made it pleasurable so that we'll keep doing it and keep procreating. But there will be none of that in heaven, so why would I build my entire identity on an appetite that's going away that is not eternal? It's because I'm over-functioning in my feelings. I'm over-functioning. I'm too attached to my appetites and not attached enough to my father. See, Jesus wasn't controlled by feelings. If he was, he would have got off the cross. But he, he stayed on it. And what does he call every disciple to do? Take up your cross and follow me. See, every disciple is called to self-denial. Everyone. And that applies to every appetite. And my, my concern for us is we will re-enter the world. And in this re-entry, we will have not allowed God to reorder us enough. Again, the worst thing that we can do is next weekend head out to an all-you-can-eat buffet. You will cause your stomach to expand and you will be in immense pain. I speak from experience. Don't do that. Don't gorge yourself again on the thing that you took away. We've also been fasting from social media. And, 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 and I hope you're having conversations with your family, spouse, group, church, pastor, whoever, and say, man, how do I re-engage with this to where I don't get back to a point where I was controlled by it? Because I'm, I'm so, anybody who's done that, you, you have more peace now? Less anxious? You're less driven by media and stimulation that wigs out your systems. But again, I understand that some Christians throughout the centuries have been like, well, get away from it completely. I understand the thrust to that. But when it comes to food and when it comes to media, I'm not saying we have to disconnect from it forever. 
But we do have to get to an emotional maturity place where we're not controlled by it too. Where we place, watch this, grooves and limits in our life that we don't allow ourselves to go outside the bounds of what is healthy anymore. We're not controlled by it, but we're, we're not disconnected from it. I'm not letting my family control me and their opinions of me, but I don't have to remain disconnected from them. I can connect to them in a way that doesn't participate in their chaos. I can connect with my food and my feelings in a way that doesn't participate in their chaos because I'm not defined by them. And that's how Jesus lived. And what I'm saying is how we re-enter matters. In fact, let me use as an illustration about re-entry. I was thinking about this and, and I thought, oh, what about the space program? And how the space shuttle takes off out of our atmosphere, orbits our Earth in a weightless experience, and then has to come back in. I wonder how dangerous the reentry is. And I'm going to read this to you, and it may sound a little nerdy, but follow me here because I think it's awesome. It says, a space shuttle is both a lifeboat and a death trap. Every launch is a potential explosion. Every orbit, a flight through a shooting gallery. But the real hazard has always been on the way down, the reentry. The shuttle, now listen to this. The shuttle must hit the upper atmosphere at exactly the right angle. And it only gets one chance. The pilot has control, but most of the decisions are taken by onboard computers. An hour before landing and practically one-fifth of the way around the globe, the shuttle must fire its rocket engines, listen to this, to slow itself down as it drops towards Earth. Around 3,000 miles west of the runway, it should enter the atmosphere at 400,000 feet and 22 times the speed of sound, tilting its nose by 40 degrees so that the thermal tiles in the underbelly will serve as a heat shield and the hull of the spacecraft will act as an air brake. In effect, the vehicle is hit by a 1,700 mile per hour wind. Cat 5 hurricanes are over 100 miles an hour. The orbiter and its crew must rely on the strength of a decades-old engineering design and a set of replaceable foam tiles to take the heat. At this point, all communication is cut off. The temperature of more than 1,500 degrees, the air around the spacecraft, it strips electrons from the atoms in the surrounding atmosphere. This creates a zone of electromagnetic disturbance that no radio waves can penetrate. For 17 or more minutes, the shuttle is out of contact. It loses three feet in height for every 15 feet it covers. This is a descent far steeper than one made by any other powered aircraft. At around 170,000 feet, about 30 miles, the craft's navigational equipment should pick up beacon signals from its landing strip and began to slalom in a series of wide swings to slow its speed further. At 40,000 feet, while traveling at one and a half times the speed of sound, it executes a 180 degree turn and takes a bearing on its runway. At 13,000 feet, its speed drops to 400 miles per hour. Its landing gear drops 11 seconds before touchdown, and it hits the runway at more than 200 miles per hour. All this time, it is at the mercy of sudden gust of winds. There is no margin for error, no second chance, and no hope of bailing out, or you'll burn up. That's re-entry. And what I'm saying to you is your entry back is just as perilous, just as dangerous. And if you don't hit it at the right angle, going the right speeds, in the right presence of mind with your father, you'll burn up too. It will be a day later and you're already back to your old anxious self because you already walked on from Jesus and it's causing you great distress. And all I'm saying is I don't want that for us. So we have to beware 
of the bread. Right? This seven days, they were eating unleavened bread. And now they're going back and they can eat breadsticks from Olive Garden again. They can eat loaves of bread. They can eat dough again. And Jesus says, beware of the leaven. Real quick, you don't have to turn there, but Matthew 16, verse 11 and 12, it says this. How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Verse 12, then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread. But listen to this, but of the teaching of Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, again, when we get af after this season, I'm not saying and you don't need to be aware of bread. You do, and leaven and carbs and all that stuff. But that's not the main thing that you need to be aware of. It's the teaching of the culture that you're going back into. The culture that tells you to hurry again. The culture that tells you to get ahead again. The culture that tells you to go on ahead from truth again. The culture that tells you live by your feelings and your appetites. They are who you are. And here's what I found fascinating. Leaven is yeast. I've got the definition of it here on the screen and then we're done. Leaven is yeast. Now listen to this. A culture which grows in dough. Those of you who made home bread, homemade bread before, you know what I'm talking about because you got to keep yeast alive. You got to feed it because it consumes things. And then you put it in the dough and it makes it rise, right? And it's beautiful. It's awesome. But Jesus is making a bigger point. This yeast is this. Look at the other definition, pretense or hypocritical teaching, false teaching. That's what Jesus is saying. Church, we're going back into a culture that does not honor your father. That will honor feelings above your father. And you and I have to learn how to live in that culture. Watch this. In a way to where that culture doesn't live in us. Because that culture can grow in this dough. And if it grows in me in such a way that it makes me burn up, beware of the culture. And think of that word culture. The root word is cult. We need to awaken to the idea that our culture around us is a cult. We think of cults as like crazy people who live in compounds. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying that's not all. Culture, a cult is simply a group of people that reinforce a belief system and the behaviors that go with it. And if the cult of the world is raising in us, rising in us, then we need to beware. And we're not ready for reentry because we'll burn up. So maybe you need to spend some more time with your father and say, Father, I don't want to be defined by my feelings. I want to be defined by your word. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace. You do love us but you love us in truth, grace and truth. And you're full of both. So grace is not a license to be driven by feelings, but grace is the power to live into the truth. And so God, I pray right now for anybody who doesn't know, like Jesus said, you don't know the Father. God, I pray right now you'd save them.
open up their eyes to the truth about who you are. No one looking around or talking here as we close. If you've never trusted in Jesus, you can pray with me. You don't have to do it out loud, but it goes like this. You can say, Father, thank you for loving me. That you sent your son in my place for my sin. I want to be defined by your word. Who is Jesus? And I confess that your word says I'm a sinner and that I need a savior. So would you save me? Free me. I give you my life. Thank you for loving me. Again, nobody looking around or talking. If you've never publicly professed what you just prayed, then this is simply an easy way to do that. Ultimately, baptism is the public profession. But we just want to know who you are so we can help you, give you a gift. And so if you just pray to profess Christ and you're in one of our physical locations, would you just simply lift up your hand so we can see you? Thank you. We got men and women going to walk around, give you a gift, and when they do, you can put it down. Thank you. It's awesome. And then those of us who have trusted in Jesus. Listen, I know it is a struggle. I am human too. It is a struggle to not live in your feelings of what your appetites inside of you say to do. And God is gracious with you. He is patient with you. He will help you. But you have to remain in him. You can't walk on from him. And so if you're anything like me, in some ways I'm scared to death to eat again because I know me. But I don't want to re-enter this time and burn up like I have in the past. And so we're just going to ask God to give us the grace to Father, would you give us the grace to re-enter well? To help us be like Jesus, who wasn't controlled by, but wasn't disconnected from. He was the healthiest person who's ever lived. And the beauty of that is through your spirit, you can empower us to walk like he walked. And so, God, would you help us to not be controlled by our feelings as we re-enter and eat certain things again and engage in certain things again? God, help us to see what is sinful and what is not, what is too much and what is outside your word. God, we don't want to be controlled by our feelings. But we don't want to be disconnected from them. We don't be controlled by the feelings of others, but we don't want want to be disconnected from them. So would you help us? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.